Okay, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I just want to thank you for coming. My name is Sarah Scott, and I am the librarian at Whitehall Library. A lifetime ago, when it was 2019 and getting sick from Corona just implied a bad hangover, we received a grant from Pennsylvania Partners in the Arts. The awarded funds allowed us to offer a number of free creative workshops with instructors from Creative Nonfiction, Contemporary Craft, Community College of Allegheny County, and other freelance published authors. Our end goal was to publish a community-wide collection of stories, poetry, and art. The theme for our anthology was exploration, and the deadline for submission was March 1st, 2020. You can probably guess what happened next. <laughs> With the library in lockdown and the theme of exploring now in poor taste, the project went dormant. Weeks passed, then months. It wasn't until one year later that the writers were finally able to shake the dust from their pieces, working and reworking their drafts, learning to look critically not only at their own work, but at each other's. With the help of author and writing instructor Dan Kirk, the writers refined their submissions and prepared their drafts for the printer. In a moment, you will hear from some of the authors as they give you a brief glimpse into their writing. As you will discover, some writers took the theme literally, sending us to other countries or into outer space. Some considered internal exploration on self-discovery or navigating the difficult terrain of relationships. One writer even playfully investigates language itself. But no matter the direction they took, each one of these writers is now a published author, and today we get to celebrate their achievement. First up, we're going to hear from Lauren. She's actually joining us via Zoom, so I'm just gonna take a quick second, uh, plug her in, and then I'll give her introduction. So bear with me for one moment. First to read for today will be Lauren Judson, who's calling in via Zoom. Lauren grew up in Pittsburgh. She works as a theater professor at the Community College of Allegheny County and is a wife and mother. Last year, she decided that a pandemic was the perfect time to return to grad school for an MFA in poetry. Her work has been published with the local collective's annual anthology known as Voices from the Attic. We are thrilled to include her piece, Aisle A8, in our collection. And without further ado, I'll hand this over to Lauren. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, it's wonderful to be here as only a disembodied head. Uh, and I just want to say thank you to uh, Whitehall Public Library for uh, including me, uh, uh, even virtually. So um, I also want to say thank you for not just the opportunity to take the workshop, um, but the opportunity to be published. Um, as Sarah said, uh, I decided pandemic was a great time to go back to grad school. And now I'm already halfway done with an MFA in poetry. And I really do attribute a lot of that to getting to do this workshop with you all. Um, so what I'm gonna read for you is my piece that's in the anthology. It is called Isle A8. And uh, it was pre-pandemic and I was fortunate and unfortunate enough to witness uh, a fight happen in Target. Um, and I watched these two people sort of exploring what their boundaries were with each other and how they might broach those. And I just thought it was an incredibly beautiful moment, very poignant, and that's where this piece came from. So without further ado, uh, aisle A8. After the fight, you drive to Target. I need comfort in two big pajama pants and you need haagen coffee ice cream. I walk three steps ahead of you for the first time not struggling to keep up. You're slow and silent. I want to cry, but I never do that in public. The fluorescent lights are too harsh on my ruddy cheeks. Head down and arms crossed, I turn into the wrong aisle. Rawhide bones flavored like chicken liver and squeaky chew toys. Remember when we'd said we'd get a dog? I notice how long your lower lid eyelashes are, fluttering at the bottom of those copper-flecked eyes. I still can't describe the color. I smile, paper-thin corners of my mouth stretching. You still want to. A cockeyed platypus with a durable squeaker hangs by a rubber cord and waits for my answer, swinging patiently as I think of the names we talked about, boy or girl, where they'd sleep, the walks we'd take. I nod and we're enfolded, cheeks meeting in a tango, a waltz, a jitterbug, 
ecstatic relief pressed into our steadfast bones. I had forgotten how you smelled. Wild plums, gray ocean clouds, a red-throated hummingbird. Dreams and smells colliding into the blue water bowl that's too big for any puppy, now tucked in our cart. I grab your hand, boundary water content. We should get new pillows. The old ones are flat and yellowed, something made for side sleepers like us. Thank you, everybody. Okay, she is technically still with us. She's just in her chair now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so next up we have Rhonda Mills Ferguson. Rhonda Mills Ferguson's passion for writing covers several genres, and she has participated in a number of writing getaways and retreats. She recently had her first nonfiction piece, A Shining Star, published in When Life Rewrites, a memoir anthology, which we also have up here. Rhonda is a retired teacher of the blind and visually impaired and lives in Scottsdale, Pennsylvania with her husband, Rob, and her golden retriever, Coco Chanel. Reading her poem, Holding My Breath, please welcome Rhonda Mills Ferguson. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. This poem is the first poem that I've ever had published. And uh, I'm truly excited to be able to read it to you. Um, I, it came about sitting at a poolside uh, Marriott Hotel one day, and I saw two young lovers in the shallow end of the pool. And after several moments, they began to argue and they left the pool separately. <laughs> A transition occurred with this couple, and with transition brings new beginnings to explore. I write this piece to emphasize what has outlived its time must pass away to make room for new growth. The poem is entitled Holding My Breath. Grass, sweat, and bayram. Blanket our bodies as the full moon drapes the sky. Promises carved upon our hearts will surely be kept under the watchful owl of the night. Fingers entwined, lips locked, that our forevers have been spoken. Look into the windows of your soul. Is that a glimmer of doubt I see? No, no, my heart screams. It can't be. You and I have lived many times, but yet to close the door on our promises made with blood, only to have fire steel or passion. Oh, come home where you belong, your voice calls to me, as if to dispel my doubt, my question, where is home? It's with me, you say convincingly. I'm holding my breath. You won't come, my love, will you? Still holding my breath, I turn and leave. As the sun begins to rise, the Pharaoh disappears. Thank you. Next up, we will hear from Diana Workmeister. Diana Workmeister transplanted to the Pittsburgh area in 2003, but proudly holds on to her central Pennsylvania roots. Although Diana's life ambition is to go skydiving, despite her extreme fear of heights, until she works up the courage to take you to the sky, she'll continue to go on smaller adventures from the back seat of her husband's motorcycle. Sounds great. Diana's motivation and inspiration comes from watching her two young children grow, learn, and explore. Her short story, Taking the Wheel, is inspired by true events. Please welcome Diana Workmeister. Thank 
Thank you, everyone. Um, there we go. <laughs> All right. Um, yes, I'm Sarah Saddam from Central Pennsylvania, and Taking the Wheel is my short story, and it is inspired by true events, both of them uh, experiences from my own life, and really exploring the difference between having those experiences at two separate times, one as a middle schooler and on a school bus, and the other as a parent watching my child get onto that school. Breakfast went just the way I thought it would. Rose was her usual bubbly self subsiding on air. She doesn't understand how food is a necessary part of the life cycle. I could observe Rose go. She came downstairs with the biggest grin, rainbow striped tights, pink shorts, a blue stitch ate my homework t-shirt and a super puffy mock fur vest. So much for the cute first day of school outfit I painstakingly planned for her. I told myself not to sweat the small stuff, threw on a grin myself, and showered her with enough kisses to bring on Rose's giggles. Now I'm sitting at a traffic light, staring at the number 119 on the back of Rose's school bus and thinking about the bigger kids whose sneakered feet are at just about eye level. Would they comment about Rose's absolutely crazy ensemble? Would Rose handle the critique well? Who was going to come for her? Why don't they let parents ride the school bus? When would the light ever change to green? I've ridden the school bus before. I had to when we visited kindergarten for practice. Mama kept asking me if I was excited to ride my I am. I am. I am. <laughs> but it's not my first time. I've done this before. Mamas are silly. The school bus is really, really long with lots and lots of rows. So I chose my favorite and sat down all by myself. No seatbelts on school buses. I can move wherever I want. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, thank you, Diana. Uh, let's see here. Okay, next we're going to hear from Joyce. Joyce Carls was raised in the eastern suburbs of Pittsburgh. She received an associate's degree from Community College of Allegheny County and worked in retail and real estate. She now lives with her son in South Park. Joyce credits her parents with her love of travel. Every year they would pack up the car and her younger brother and herself to explore America. Her poem, however, explores a different place, but I'll let her tell it. Please welcome Joyce Girl. Visiting the Isle, rain, rhododendrons, the tropical current that leaves, an immigrant palm tree clinging to a cliff. During the potato famine, one third died and one third boarded ships. Some jaws fell open, seeing tropical foliage. Their dust is carried back home with the current to be joined by their dead ancestors mixing in the green earth. Trade winds blow and the Vikings feel the fine spray. The froth beats against bare arms, hairs tingling as they gulp and spit out the salty water. Stumbling down an obscure path, eyes strain to understand, slabs four feet high, arranged in a perfect circle. Druids hiding in the greenery, Celts or Celts, or fairies about to dance. Sheepdogs run the ring of carry, sniffing the ghosts as they wander by, while further away the bogs hide Viking longships. A certain sadness shrouds the mist as we clutch our Celtic crosses. It hugs like the rain that soaks through to the bones. You fold it all inside you, this Ireland. Thank you. Hey, 
great job, Jay. Next, we're going to hear from Jenea and Webb. Jenea has been writing since childhood and has spent the last three decades working as a journalist for numerous, numerous newspapers and magazines in the Pittsburgh area. Her longest tenure has been with the New Pittsburgh Courier, one of the country's oldest African American newspapers, where she interviews various stars of screen, stage, film, and music. I should get interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> She also enjoys penning her own fiction and poetry pieces. Today, she will be reading her poem. Please welcome Jenea. Like the first, like the first thing, everyone for coming. I see uh, people put up the room. Thanks, people. <laughs> I appreciate everyone's support um, from me starting writing as a little girl till now, and whatever is to come. Thank you all for your support always. This poem, "No More Weight on My Wings," came from a traumatic experience that happened in my life. So um, to be able to get through that, I came up with this poem. So I hope you enjoy it. No more weight upon my wings. Feathers spread wide, light, broad, moving through air. Head held high, eyes focused straight, nothing in my way. Azure skies beckon, first as a whisper, then as a shout. Wings flap harder as I soar in that big, beautiful sky towards the warmth of the sun. I have reached a self much higher, the destiny that has tickled me all along to change the world with words. Stories abound, they must be told. Nerve endings tingle, heart pumping, cheeks ready. I sing a new song, answering the question of me, a song of harmony, of peace, of joy, of love. Wings take me higher, ascending, no more waiting for my wings. No more weight upon my wings. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jamea. Next, we're going to hear from Vivian Duncan. Vivian lives in Pittsburgh with her husband, Don, who's actually also in the book as well. He's just unable to uh, attend today's event, but he has a piece as well. Vivian has driven transit and school buses for more than 20 years and was a certified school bus driver instructor when she retired from driving. She's driven hundreds of thousands of miles in various commercial vehicles and takes bus safety very seriously. Her story offers a sneak peek into life behind the wheel, and she's gonna read a small segment of her story here today. Please welcome Vivian. First of all, I'd like to first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and thank Jenea for having the crowd. <laughs> you can always count on her. <laughs> I'm going to read just a little bit out of um, the story that I wrote. I actually am one of the characters in the story and it is definitely a true story. And um, I was very happy to start writing. My husband actually encouraged it whenever he started hearing all the school bus stories of you know yesteryear. <laughs> so let's see if you like this. It was a chilly afternoon in 1969. The yellow bus made its way down Arlington Avenue, an old windy road just barely wide enough for two vehicles to pass. The road seemed to separate the country from the city, switching from row houses to old family homesteads. Many school children lived on the two mile stretch of Arlington Avenue. So by the time the driver, Mr. Brown, made his way around the ending cul-de-sac, only four riders remained. Suddenly, the bus began to swerve from side to side, 
To the children, it looked like the driver was passed out at the wheel. Mr. Brown, someone screamed. With a crash, the bus veered over the embankment and landed at the angle on the driver's side with student entry doors stuck up in the air, aloft. Panicking, the young riders cried and screamed for help. Mr. Brown remained slumped over the steering wheel, unmoving. The children called out, Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown. There was no answer back. So if you want to know what happened, you have to get the <laughs> Yeah, there's a cliffhanger if you've ever heard one. <laughs> All right. The last person we're going to hear from today is actually um, a very special member of this group. Uh, he, his piece is the first short story in our collection, and he is one of our uh, writing instructors. So he has been our advisor from the very beginning. Um, this is Dan Kirk right here. He, uh, yes, thank you, thank you. He, uh, before the pandemic happened, he taught a four-week creative writing course. Um, and then after the pandemic, he helpfully taught a series of revision workshops earlier this year. Dan holds a Master of Arts in Theater Arts from Marquette University and a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing from Chatham University. His debut novel, Between the Innings, was published in 2017, and his original play, Parlor Games, was produced by Presto Players in 2018. He lives in Baldwin with his wife and their three children. Thank you, and come on up, Dan. I tend to speak loud to begin with, so if the microphone is too much, please give me a gut symbol. <laughs> I have so many things I want to thank people about. Sarah, thank you much for the opportunity and for guiding this wonderful ship that we were all able to put together. <laughs> thank you, writers. It was so great to share the time with you that we had and to learn your experience and get to know you through your words. Over at Chatham, Cheryl St. Germain talks about being a, to, to write is to be a part of a community. We envision writers as this rustic old angry person with a glass of whiskey and a typewriter, a little lamp, and just pounding out life's tragedies. But we need not know that in the modern age, we're part of something together. We have to share each other's resources, help each other, encourage each other. So the fact that this is done through a local library, I think is so meaningful because the library is a vibrant part of the community. And if we keep it alive, young people will continue to come and see the resources and realize, oh, it's not just a place to check out books. There's so much here. So I think that's a wonderful opportunity to, to tie that together. I think back to when we first started, I think it was December of 2019, we first started emailing. And we were looking at, ah, what should we do the schedule? Should it be three weeks, two weeks, six weeks? What should we do? And things always work out perfectly because I think our last class was February 27th or 26th. And then the world changed. <laughs> I was like, okay, glad well, we got the class done at least. Because we were this tiny room over here. And there's no way we could have social distance in that space. We're like an old-fashioned classroom, all crammed in together, moving around our tables. And the three gentlemen who worked with us have not come today, so I want you to let you know there were guys involved in this too. So gentlemen, if you want to write, pick up your pen and start writing. So I, I was so grateful for the opportunity and the experience. And then the, the, the theme tied in so uniquely for exploration. Where did we go as a country, a culture, a world with this pandemic and I think, only, I think writers now are only really starting to reflect on that. I haven't even had really time to sit down and write about the experience of the pandemic. So explorations continue when life throws things at us. I think that's a, a wonderful irony to the way this all worked out. We'll always remember it and we'll always have things to write about and to talk about through our words. And uh, so in terms of my piece, it also goes to show what writing is as an exploration itself because this story was drafted so long ago, I can't even tell you the year. I had a friend named Michael Poteet, who's a good writer himself in Philadelphia, and we always challenge each other. We'll just send each other sentences and say, this is your first sentence, go. And he gave me the first sentence of this, and he's a big science fiction writer. So I was like, I'm gonna write science fiction to prove to Mike that I can do it too, because I'm always writing like family literature and you know, life lesson literature. So the ex exploration of writing itself takes us to a journey of self-discovery because we have to go through this process of is it good enough is it what i want it to be am i willing to take some time away and think about it for a while and i give these writers a lot of credit because they had a whole year off 
And then they dove back in. And I think most of you saw, oh, this can be better. I can always rework my writing. I can always change something and tweak it enough. But I really love that part. That has to stay there. So the way that writing evolves is a part of exploration. And in, if it's in a science fiction genre, you want to just try. Or if it's from personal experiences, like some of you mentioned, we always have that opportunity to explore the world that exists in our minds through writing. So I think it all kind of, it kind of came together nicely in kind of that serendipity of what writing should be, that even though we were disappointed with the time off and the struggles and the loss and the heartbreak and suffering, that's part of the world experience that we writers need to be aware of. So, that was, oops. And thank you to Vivian's friend for these wonderful bookmarks that I'll pick up afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'd just read the first two paragraphs of my short story, which is kind of a science fiction bent. And as you read it, I think you'll see that you can always tie in human experiences in the science fiction world, which I think is what makes it so interesting. And I realized that my last name is Kirk, and I'm not that big of a Star Trek fan. I'm uh, more of a Star Wars guy. So this is a cleansing. Brenda stepped from eternity into a yesterday. She had feared would evade her forever. It was her first return to Earth after the planetary wars, and she was nervous. Why? She thought to herself, am I taking part in this experiment? I hated this world enough when I was first here. What could a hundred years of death do to change anything? She observed the desolate landscape. New York, New York, she thought. So nice they named it twice. So vile they bombed it thrice. She remembered part from a slogan she had read on a t-shirt. The rest she had lived. Sweat gathered at her throat and trickled down her chest and onto her belly. It was a sensual feeling she had not remembered. Stephen said that her sweat was repulsive. Brenda was the only person he knew that could sweat from the neck. Still, it excited him, stimulating and erotic in his deprivation. Stephen was like that, strange, kinky, abusive. She forced the thought from her memory and glided onward. This is my mission, she told herself. I must carry forward if I am ever to experience order again. Thank you. Oh, well, I'm to to share the author. As I had mentioned before, there were a few authors who wished they could be here, um, but were unable to attend their, this event. But you can read their poems or their short stories in the collection. Um, I'm sure some of you will have copies given or gifted to you by these authors, but if you do not or would like to purchase additional copies, um, we do have some up here. They'll be $8. Um, and uh, although that, those proceeds go to the library for um, future programs very similar to this one. In addition, it is September, which means it's Ludwig Library Month, which means um, any donation, which this would be considered, is matched by a foundation. So if you've ever thought about donating to a library, now is a really good time to do it. Um, I'm now going to encourage you to uh, mingle with the authors if you're interested, learn about their writing experience. Um, we do have some cookies in the back I get to reveal under this sheet. They're all individually packaged. Um, you can either take them with you or you can put them here, depending on your comfort level. Um, but before we depart, I just want to say, um, oh, and one last thing, we do have food trucks here as well. So we've got Yogi's and uh, Kona Ice and some other games up at the park. So if you have a minute and would like lunch, feel free to grab that as well. Um, but before we depart, before I get off the stage, if we could please just give one last round of applause for our authors on getting published. Thank <laughs> you.